living in ignorance is one of the most unpleasant experiences. Why is it so difficult to acknowledge when you're tired of a marriage and no longer in love? Instead, people resort to deceit and foolish actions. My wife lost control and was caught cheating. I ended up having some music fun myself. My name is Craig Johnson. I've been married to Carolyn for 17 years, a woman I thought loved me unconditionally. I was completely unaware that for the past six years, she has been having an affair with her boss, the owner of the real estate firm where she works. We have three children, a 16-year-old daughter, a 12-year-old son, and a lovely little girl who just turned two. I love them all dearly, except for my wife. By the way, I'm a detective sergeant. About two months ago, my youngest daughter had a fall at daycare, and my wife was unavailable to pick her up, so I stepped in. I sped there in my unmarked car with the lights flashing and rushed in to get her. She was sucking on a lollipop and sniffling. I checked her over, gave her a kiss, and ruffled her hair. The older kids hated that, but she loved it. I left her laughing and went to talk to the daycare manager. She informed me that Gig had fallen and had a deep cut on her calf. They had called an ambulance, which was on its way. I sat with my daughter and soon had her laughing again. The EMTs arrived and recommended taking her to the emergency room for stitches, so I followed the ambulance to the hospital. I tried to contact my wife, but it went to voicemail. I sent a message and then used the locator app, as Carolyn often misplaces her smartphone. The app showed she was at the holiday and just seven miles away. I stayed with my daughter while she got her stitches. Once she was done, we signed the necessary forms and I retrieved the folding infant seat from the trunk. I installed it in the back seat and secured her in, then we went to find her mother. My stomach was starting to reject the hero sandwich I had eaten for lunch. I pulled into the Holiday Inn parking lot just in time to see Carolyn and her boss, Arthur Ashe, coming out of the lobby. They were walking hand in hand, and his left hand was on her back. They laughed and smiled at each other, and then she kissed him. It was exactly the kind of kiss she usually gives me. I don't know how to explain it exactly, but it is. I stopped the big Ford and adjusted the dashboard camera to watch them approach her Lincoln Aviator. She turned to him and kissed him passionately, it was a rather unexpected maneuver. At least she didn't do that to me. His hand was slipping, yes, it was slipping by her stockings. The funny thing is that I asked her to wear stockings only when we were together. Then she reached into her pocket and pulled out her underwear, which I gave her for our anniversary. She smiled and handed them to him. It's over, I remember thinking. They laughed, kissed again, and then she got into her car and drove away. Suddenly, I saw the brake lights and she screeched to a stop. Her car was standing still and suddenly my phone rang. I looked at the number and the name, it was her. Hi, Carolyn, I replied in an even tone. What happened? Where are you? she asked with fright. I'm in the hospital, the baby is fine. Where are you? I couldn't reach you on the phone, I replied. Oh, I'm in the office. I'm on my way to the hospital now, she lied to me. Be careful on the road, I said and hung up. I watched her car while she called twice more. I've switched all calls to voicemail. She moved forward and almost crashed into a pickup truck, jumping out into the street. I smirked as I headed home. I tapped my phone and called a friend who was a private investigator, telling him I needed to talk. Once I arrived home, I carried a sleeping gig inside. I then returned to my car and retrieved four DNA swab kits. Inside, I swabbed Gig's mouth, placed the swabs in containers, sealed them, and labeled the plastic bags. I grabbed an ICT and called work, speaking with my boss, the chief of detectives. I explained that I needed the rest of the week off to handle some family matters. Everything okay? he asked. Yes, sir. I just have to see some doctors about my kids. 
Okay, just keep me informed. You got it, chief. Twenty minutes later, the girl I despised showed up. Seeing her made me physically ill, but I took a deep breath and counted to ten. I only made it to seven before she burst through the door. Where is she? She screamed. I told her to calm down, that the baby was sleeping. She pushed past me into the baby's room. I started making a list of things to do the next day, divorce lawyer, private investigator, electronic store. She stormed out of the bedroom and confronted me. What happened? She demanded. She fell, she's fine. She took it like a trooper, Gig just got four stitches and the doctor said they would leave little to no scar. She's fine, Carolyn. Why didn't they call me? She yelled. They tried, dear. They couldn't reach you. I tried, too, it went to voicemail. So where were you, dear? She started to stutter and looked away. I was in a meeting. I had turned off my phone so it wouldn't disturb the meeting. I had suggested that instead of turning it off, you put it on vibrate. Great. I'm just glad it wasn't anything serious with the kids or something deadly with me. Her face clouded over, then she turned pale. I never thought of that, she said. Of course you didn't, dear, I thought to myself. At that moment, our other two children came in from school. Marissa, who is sixteen, and Craig Jr., who is twelve, stopped in the living room and looked at their parents. What's up, Dad? asked my son. My beautiful daughter fixed her mother with a cold stare but said to me, Is everything okay, Pop? Yeah, your sister fell at daycare and cut herself. She had to get stitches at the emergency room, and I went with her. I watched my wife, she shivered. Where were you, Mom? Marissa asked. I was at a meeting, she mumbled. Obviously, my daughter knew or suspected something. Junior, as we called him, gave his mother a pointed look. Really, Mom, he said. Carolyn squirmed and blushed red. I need to take a shower, she said, turning away. I couldn't resist. Didn't you take one this morning? I asked innocently. She stumbled and looked at me as if trying to make me spontaneously combust. Get over it, Craig, she hissed, then turned and went upstairs. I turned to my kids and was surprised at their expressions. They were devastated and looked at me forlornly. It will be okay, guys, just a spat. If you say so, Daddy, said Marissa. Junior just shook his head. How about pizza? I asked. I called and ordered pizza. Thirty minutes later, two large pizzas arrived, one pepperoni, one mushroom. The kids dug in, even little gig, and we waited for their mother. She showed up and turned up her nose. You know I only like anchovies, she snarled. So sue me, I said. She shot me a smoldering look and went to pour herself some wine. The kids were snickering and casting sidelong glances at their mother. She stormed out somewhere, and the kids and I talked about school and social events like dates and such that night. It felt like midnight at the South Pole, and I had to get another blanket. It had been a while since we had been intimate, like three months. It was only getting worse. The next day, I consulted a lawyer to explore my options. She had no tolerance for cheaters, especially unfaithful wives, and had a soft spot for police officers. However, she informed me that we lived in a no-fault state, so regardless of the circumstances, I would be at a disadvantage unless my wife agreed to my terms. She advised me to collect any and all evidence available, and we would see what could be done. She mentioned that in terms of alimony, I was in a relatively good position because my wife earned more than I did. Additionally, due to her age, my oldest daughter could choose which parent she wanted to live with. I then met with a private investigator and arranged for surveillance of my wife and her friend. He was a good friend and a former colleague, so the cost would be manageable, 
and I would obtain all the necessary evidence. Then, I went to the electronics store and bought several wireless recorders and three video cameras. I went home and installed the cameras in the master bedroom, living room, and guest room. I planned to put one of the recorders in her car, one on a bookshelf in the living room, and one in the master bedroom. Later, I received a message from my spouse saying she would be late coming home and asked me to take care of the kids until she arrived. I geared up, picked up gig, and then returned home to start dinner. About two hours later, my two oldest kids came home, and we discussed dinner plans, grilled chicken, mashed potatoes, and creamed spinach. How does that sound? I asked. Sounds delicious, Marissa said. Junior looked at me, smirked a little, and asked, What does mom want? I told him mom could get her own dinner. Marissa and Junior exchanged glances, and then Marissa said, Daddy, we need to talk. I assumed I was about to get scolded, so we moved to the kitchen and started preparing dinner. She began, Dad, I think mom is fooling around. She's disrespecting you, and she's never around when we need her. Mace is right, Pop, Junior chimed in. I'm glad they inherited good looks and brains, no matter where they got them from. I stopped what I was doing and gathered them into a group hug, their younger sister immediately joined in, shouting, Me too, me too. I glanced at my children and confessed my love for them, emphasizing it even exceeded my self-love, a sentiment I often shared, though they usually found it cheesy. Yet, I needed to express my concern about their mother's actions. But remember, you're my children. We'll overcome this, I promise. Junior suggested, Dad, maybe you should do a paternity test on us. It might help your case. It won't change my feelings for you, but it would shed light on her actions, Dad, Marissa added. Their honesty stunned me, and I empathized with their hurt. Okay. Let's do it before she returns. I obtained cheek swabs, sealed them, and stowed them in my briefcase. The following day, I rushed the samples to an independent lab. It cost extra, but I needed closure fast. A week and a half later, the results arrived. None of the children were biologically mine. Despite my reluctance, I had to attend her company's 4th of July party at the owner's house. She was a top salesperson and needed my presence, armed with evidence, tapes, photos, recordings, videos, receipts, and DNA results. I knew I had everything I needed against her and her lover. I just hadn't determined the best approach or timing. Either way, it felt like I was already defeated, so I went. She mentioned it would be a family gathering, so the kids weren't invited. Looking back, it turned out to be a good thing. We arrived a little past 11 a.m. and grabbed a couple of drinks, bud for me, white wine for her. She wore a yellow sundress, no bra, espadrilles, and a shawl, she looked stunning. I stuck close to her, not exactly following her every move but keeping an eye on her. Her friend found her and chatted her up for a while, whispering sweet nothings in her ear before returning to his host duties. He disappeared, and I immediately heightened my surveillance on Carolyn. She kept scanning the area, and after her third glass of wine, she lost track of me. Alcohol didn't sit well with her, and she was dangerously close to being intoxicated. I observed as she grabbed one more glass of wine and slipped away to the far end of the expansive property where his house was situated. Two of her colleagues tried to distract me, but I switched to Coca-Cola after drinking half of my bud. They were a little drunk, but I managed to follow her as she headed to the corner of the garden shed and disappeared behind it. Putting my Coke on the table, I took out my cell phone and turned on the video camera. Sneaking around the corner of the barn, I went unnoticed and headed for the gate at the back of the building. Looking around the corner, I noticed my wife. I was extremely lucky, if I may say so, because I witnessed my wife cheating on me. I won't go into details, but it looked terrible. Apparently, they both liked it. 
the only thing I realized is that what used to belong to me is no longer mine. I took a couple of pictures and headed in their direction. I reached for his ridiculous man bun, grabbed hold of it, and pulled him away from my wife. Spinning him around, I delivered a powerful right hook to his face, shattering his nose and fracturing his left cheekbone in the process. I ended up injuring my hand. He slumped to the ground unconscious, while Carolyn collapsed beside the shed. Quickly, I retrieved my handcuffs and secured him to the fence post, reciting his rights as I did so. You are being arrested for molestation. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in court. Carolyn's cries of confusion pierced the air. You also have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be provided for you. Do you understand these rights? Carolyn's panic escalated as she struggled to stand. I dialed 911 on my cell phone and waited for help to arrive. 911, what's your emergency? This is Detective Craig Johnson, badge number 714. I'm at 6132, Larson Street, and I have apprehended a suspect who apparently molested a woman. I need immediate backup, an on-site ambulance, and a gathering is taking place in a private house. Carolyn was furious. It's not what you think. He didn't molest me. Here's the situation, Carolyn, I said sternly. This is an attack. I have video recordings, audio recordings, photographs, receipts, the time frame of your location, and DNA samples of our three children proving that they are not mine. You will either cooperate, or you will never see your children again. Her face turned pale, and she collapsed to the ground, shouting, No! I helped her up, wrapping her up gently. Carolyn, I whispered, my underwear you didn't need it five minutes ago. Why do you think you need it now? Leave it to the criminologists. I helped her up, she was crying, gasping for breath, and sniffling. We moved slowly across the backyard toward the patio. As we approached, the small crowd of around ten people outside fell silent, then became visibly shocked. They stepped aside, and I guided her to an empty chaise lounge where she sat down. Her two slightly intoxicated friends hurried over and began shouting, What happened? What did you do to her? I didn't do anything, I replied calmly. Your boss assaulted her. What? Donna screamed. You heard me, I replied, and you didn't know? Laura shrieked. No, what? I inquired. She said she had an open marriage. She said you were okay with it, she lied. I stated. Just then, the police arrived. I directed the two officers to garden and study instructed them read. Him is rights again as I wasn't sure he had heard me. The desk sergeant arrived with another patrolman, and I instructed the officer to take statements and addresses from Donna and Laura. The perpetrator's wife pushed her way through the crowd, demanding to know what was going on. The sergeant explained that her husband had been arrested and filled her in on the details. She burst into insults, lost her composure, and tried to attack Carolyn, who was almost in a stupor. At that moment, the police intervened and paramedics arrived shortly after. I briefly described the situation to them, and they put Carolyn on a stretcher. When she got up, there was a small puddle on the chaise lawn. Tears streamed down her face as she sobbed. I told them to take her to the emergency room and have an examination so that they could bring charges against her abuser. Then other police officers took Arthur out, his face swollen and his hands handcuffed behind his back. He foolishly stated that they had a mutual understanding and that the meeting took place by mutual consent. Unfortunately, his wife overheard and brought down her anger on him. You're a jerk, she said. The police detained her again, and she threatened legal action. You will hear about this from my lawyer. I trailed them to the emergency room, filling out all the paperwork because, well, she was still my spouse. Then I headed to the police station and lodged a complaint against him. 
since it was Saturday, he wouldn't face charges until Monday. He attempted to reach his lawyer, but his wife had already beaten him to it. Returning to the ER, I visited my soon-to-be ex-wife. She wasn't doing well and looked visibly distressed. When she noticed me, she tried to muster a smile, but seeing my expression, she recoiled. So, Carolyn, how long has this been going on? I asked. She trembled, tears welling up in her eyes. It wasn't supposed to be serious, just a brief affair. I didn't intend for it to. Oh, come on, Carolyn. I advanced toward her, stopping just short of her face. Gig isn't mine, Junior isn't mine, and Marissa isn't mine. That's seventeen years we've been married. For seventeen years. Do the math, damn it. You're supposed to be one of the top salespersons. Why, Carolyn? Why? Her tears quickly turned into a smirk as she wiped her eyes. Because I can. You're the detective, figure it out. I can have any man I want, and you're clueless. I gazed at my soon-to-be ex-wife, feeling a part of me wither away. My eyes pierced through her, conveying an icy detachment. Before me, she seemed to age centuries, her presence shrinking. Oh God, what's wrong with me, she murmured. Guiding her gently by the arm, I escorted her to the car, settling her into the passenger seat. I slid in behind the wheel and drove to her parents' house. She stared blankly out the window until we arrived, her voice breaking the silence. What are we doing here? I want to go home. People in hell want ice water, I retorted sharply. I stepped out of the car, helped her out, and guided her to the front door. I pressed the doorbell, and when it opened, her father was there. Frank, I said, your daughter needs to stay here for a while. I'll return tomorrow to explain. She just left the emergency room. Please take care of her. He looked at me incredulously. I turned and walked away. I powered off my phone and headed home. Walking in, I found my kids staring at me. Where's mom? She's with your grandparents. She'll be staying there for a bit. I briefed them on the situation, leaving out the gruesome details. After some tears and sniffles, they accepted it, understanding my actions but puzzled by hers. Welcome to the club, I thought. I collected the reports tapes, photos, private investigators' reports, and receipts pertaining to her. I organized everything into four packages, including only the DNA results. After contacting the lawyer, I initiated the divorce proceedings and requested a restraining order, citing the police report and molestation kit. I provided the DNA results to the lawyer separately. Then I drove to the home of the individual involved and spoke with his wife, Lorna. I apologized for the disturbance, and she sympathized with me regarding the situation. I handed her the packet of documents and advised her to utilize whatever she found helpful. She seemed hesitant but thanked me nonetheless. I departed and headed home. On the way, I made a stop at my in-law's place, handing one of the packets to my soon-to-be ex-father-in-law. Your daughter is in a difficult situation. She needs professional help, I told him before leaving. Then I drove back home. The following day, we attended church and later went to Denny's for breakfast. I kept my phone turned off the entire day and night. Monday morning, I went to work and learned the arraignment schedule for the individual I disdain. I attended the court session and endured the proceedings. His attorney attempted to argue consensual intimacy and denied any molestation allegations. The statements of the two women from the party were presented. While the judge seemed skeptical, she dismissed the charges with prejudice, allowing for recharging if circumstances changed. When he noticed me, he smirked, but his expression quickly changed when he was served with legal papers on his way out, including a restraining order, courtesy of whoever his wife had hired. As I left, I couldn't help but smirk back, not quite settled yet when I arrived home. I brought along the molestation kit copies, 
the police report, and a DNA analysis from the kit. Can you guess who my daughter's biological father turned out to be? As I was speaking with my attorney on the phone, there was a knock at my front door. Only one person I know knocks instead of ringing the doorbell. True to form, it was my current brother-in-law, Anthony. Anthony was Carolyn's elder brother, just three years older. He ran his own construction firm, and there were whispers about his ties to the mob. His son had some drug troubles a while back, and I used my influence, mostly legitimate, to help him out. After getting him into a program and getting clean, he's now in his third year of seminary and doing well. It's safe to say I was his favorite uncle by marriage, so this visit likely wasn't just a social call. Tony brushed past me and greeted my kids, who adored him, along with his wife Teresa and their three children. After freeing himself from their embraces, he turned to me and said, Let's talk on the back porch. We stepped onto the back porch, and he asked, What's happening? Carolyn is a wreck at mom and dad's, and dad's furious. Did she explain anything to you? You kicked her out, then she got evasive and refused to talk. That was right after dad confronted her with the evidence you gave him. What's going on? Did you see any of dad's findings? He wouldn't allow it, I replied, exhaling heavily. Your sister has been cheating on me for 17 years. None of my kids are biologically mine. She's been with others, and I don't even know who Marissa or Junior's real father is. She probably doesn't either. Gits' dad is her current boss, Arthur Dash. Plus, she has gonorrhea and is pregnant but not with my child. Your dad knows everything I do, except for the molestation kit and police report. But my lawyer has those. Legal action is underway, and she'll be served this week. He slumped into a chair, his expression one of devastation as he looked at me. No chance of what would you know, I get it. They dropped the charges against the jerk, that's what I call him. And he was served by his wife who's got everything your dad has thanks to me. I didn't mean to be harsh on your folks, Tony, but with your sister's current attitude, I didn't want them to be misinformed. She really needs professional help. I understand, just a bit shocking, that's all. Tell me about it. We chatted for a while, then he stood to leave. So, what's the plan with the jerk, he asked. I'm not sure. Anything I do will backfire on me. I know what I want to do, but no offense, she's not worth going to jail for. He looked me straight in the eye and said, Don't worry, I'll handle it. You're still family, it won't reflect on you. I won't harm sister, but he'll get his. This will settle the score, brother. Tony, don't do it, I pleaded. Do what? he retorted then turned and left before I could say anything else. My wife was taken to her parents' house on Thursday. She collapsed and had to be rushed to the emergency room. She stayed in the hospital for about a week before returning to her parents' house. Her father approached me, asking if there was any way we could reconcile. Didn't you see what I gave you? I asked. Yes, but clearly she made a mistake. A mistake? I shouted. Scratching the car was a mistake. Forgetting to deposit a check was a mistake. Having an affair for seventeen years, getting pregnant by another man, passing off his child as yours, and withholding intimacy from your husband was not a mistake. I was relieved that the children were at day camp when I exploded at their grandfather. After calming down, I instructed him to have her sign the papers. I was done with her. He was displeased with both of us, tough luck. Something intriguing unfolded. She was served about twelve weeks ago. Three weeks later, her husband vanished. He missed his appointment with their lawyer. It turned out she was the primary owner of Dash Realty for tax purposes. Consequently, she wasn't too worried and adjusted her lawsuit to reflect abandonment. The divorce proceedings continued but now it would stretch over a year. 
Carolyn was two months pregnant, so we had to wait another seven months to wrap everything up. So, we waited. As time passed, her lawyer attempted to renegotiate the settlement, claiming she deserved more. I had proposed letting her keep the house and offering a 10% settlement. She retained her 401k and our savings account. Visitation rights were limited to one weekend every two months at her parents' house with no presence of any other companions, male or female, except Marissa, whom she refused to see. Her lawyer opposed nearly every term. I instructed my lawyer to arrange a meeting. I arrived at my lawyer's office half an hour early, inserted a DVD into his projector, grabbed a cup of coffee, and took a seat. When she and her lawyer arrived, he introduced himself, and Carolyn extended her hand. I recognize you, no need for introductions, her lawyer suggested, maintaining civility and shooting him a stern look, causing him to falter. They began negotiating. For hours later, they hadn't made any progress. I vetoed several points and even retracted a few. Then she exploded, accusing me of being unreasonable. That's when I dropped the bomb. All right, answer one question truthfully and maybe I'll reconsider. I pressed play on the DVD player. The footage showed Carolyn and the jerk leaving the Holiday Inn, captured by the dash cam of my police car. She hadn't seen it before and was unaware of its existence. The video played until the moment she produced the blue lace underwear. I paused it and turned to her. Her face drain of color, mouth agape. At a meeting, huh, Carolyn? So where are the anniversary panties, my dear wife? Huh? Where the hell are they? If you don't sign as is, we're going to court, and everything will become public. Sign it. She burst into tears, seized a pen, and signed everything. Her lawyer was stunned. As she grabbed her purse and stood up, her water broke. She cried out. We called for an ambulance and rushed her to the hospital. I ensured that my name wasn't on the birth certificate. She delivered a six pounds seven ounce baby boy. My lawyer demanded a DNA test, and lo and behold, it wasn't mine. Not only that, it wasn't the other guy's either. She had been cheating on her lover. The divorce was finalized, and I was finally liberated. Suddenly, I became a hot commodity in the dating scene. My daughter even called me a hottie. My son warned me to watch my back or else I might get ambushed. Wink, wink. I visited my brother-in-law, and we shared a couple of beers. Eventually, I inquired about the other guy. Who, he responded, raising an eyebrow. Never mind, I replied. I went on some dates, but my heart wasn't in it. Approximately two years later, Tony and Teresa hosted a barbecue, extending invitations to everyone, even my ex-wife. While the kids kept their distance from her and the gentleman she arrived with, her young son proved to be quite charming, earning adoration from my daughters. Meanwhile, my 18-year-old daughter brought along her own companion who, in my opinion, passed muster, though I wouldn't dare admit it to her. The man accompanying my ex-wife couldn't seem to take his eyes off my daughter, a situation I observed but opted not to intervene in so as not to embarrass her. However, as he persistently approached her, I was on the verge of stepping in when her own male friend arrived. What's going on, sweetheart, he inquired. None of your business, buddy. We were in the middle of a conversation, she retorted. Oh, pardon me, he replied. I was just trying to protect you from getting hurt. His hand began to approach, prompting her to firmly demand, get your hands off me, before quickly disabling him with a punch and a DEA maneuver that resulted in his thumb being broken, prompting screams that attracted everyone's attention. I don't adhere to my mother's standards, she said. Her boyfriend couldn't help but smile. That's my girl, I mentally encouraged. Upon seeing the commotion, her mother rushed over, yelling, What have you done? My brother-in-law, who saw the whole thing, stepped in and suggested, I think it's best if you both leave. 
Once the guests departed, the party's atmosphere relaxed. Then a new guest arrived. My sister-in-law quickly moved to hug a stunning brunette, about five feet eight inches with a petite build and seemingly endless legs. She had a charming, girl-next-door look with hazel eyes touched with gold. She was breathtaking, at least to me. My son came over and playfully nudged me. Don't stare, old man, he joked. What do you mean? I replied. Then my sister-in-law introduced the beautiful woman to me. Kurt, meet my sister Angelina. Oh, man. All the good ones are taken, I thought to myself. She had just moved here, had a ten-year-old son, and was a lawyer starting fresh after her husband's death in Afghanistan. Teresa looked at me and said, I told her everything about you. Maybe you two can help each other. Angie looked at me and said, We can give it a try. Gulp, 